coming up on this week's episode. Although his numbers in terms of his goals and assists, etc., haven't been huge amounts, for me he's been maybe the sign of the season in terms of uh, the fee. He also uh, deserves a bit of credit for the second goal as well, not only for the assist but the fast thinking in terms of taking a quick free kick. His leadership qualities, the stability in the team, um, coming to the team as well, brand new league for him, he's done really, really well. I think he actually deserves a spot in the team. He can receive in the half turn, he intercepts a lot, blocks a lot, tackles a lot. Salah, who has scored 17 goals, 4 assists, but for me, his forms may have been up and down this season. Uh, he doesn't make um, a final cut. Yes, guys, welcome back to the TIC YouTube channel. I'm Coach Indy. You're watching another episode of the Premier League Appetizer Show. Guys, if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do so. It does help the channel grow a little bit further. We're obviously trying to reach 10K subscribers in our first year. So play your part, help the channel grow, and please share the content as well. So on today's episode, we're talking all things game week 29. Remember, there was only four games, so we'll just be running through those results, talking about some of the talking points, and maybe how the league table sort of left everyone after those round of games. We're talking about one piece of other news, but it is huge other news, and it revolves around the female game here in the UK, which we'll touch on in a moment. Um, and today, because there's an international break coming for the next two weeks or so, um, and there's no game week 30 fixtures to look forward to this week, we're actually going to be doing my team of the season or the Premier League team of the season so far. So it'd be interesting to see what your guys' reaction is going to be to my team of the season. Um, however, it's just my opinion. You guys might agree, disagree. Um, we'll have a look at that in a, in a few moments as well. Um, so yeah, we'll just dive into game week 29 results. So the first game was Friday night, Fulham versus Leeds. Huge game for, particularly Fulham, the bottom of the table. If they won the game, they played on the Friday night. If they won the game, they would have gone outside the relegation zone. Put the Newcastle into the relegation zone and put huge pressure on the Brighton versus Newcastle game the following night. However, it finished 2 1 to Leeds, so that didn't happen. Game itself, Bamford scored a goal, um, Lookman got the assist for Anderson's equaliser in the first half. Over in the second half, Rafinha scored from a Bamford assist, so um, a good win for Leeds. Uh, it just goes to show um, how Leeds can perform on a half decent pitch. Everyone knows what going on with uh, Leeds pitch at the moment, how awful it is, and it's not really conducive to playing a sort of a nice, attractive type of football. So, given the fact they're on the road, it probably helped them quite a bit. So, okay, a good win for Leeds. It pushes them up to, I think, 11th in the league, so just outside the top 10. And obviously, Fulham that leaves them 18th in the league. So, fast forward in 24 hours, you've got Brighton versus Newcastle. Now, this is a huge game. Um, before the, the Fulham game and the result sort of came in, it's now even bigger because it can alleviate some pressure if someone gets a positive result. And for Brighton's sake, it finished a positive result for them. They won the game 3-0. Goals from Trossard, Welbeck and Mopay, the, the front three really sort of excelling in this game. And Newcastle were quite toothless, really. Didn't create a lot. Fraser had one chance, which is the post. Um, and they had sort of a couple of other half chances, but nothing sort of worth noting too much. And so a huge win for Brighton. It puts them, I think, seven points outside the relegation zone. Um, which at this stage of the season is quite a big chunk, and, and they've also got a fairly decent goal difference. So they're on minus four for someone who's sort of seven, 16th in the league. That's pretty good going. Suggests that they don't get um, battered sort of whenever they do lose. If that makes sense. Uh, moving on to Sunday games. There's two games to talk about. First game was West Ham versus Arsenal. A uh, really really good game actually. It finished three three. Um, it really was a tale of two halves. If I'm totally honest, West Ham absolutely dominate the first half. Went 3 0 up within sort of 33 minutes. Uh, goals from um, Jay Lings. Uh, really, really good strike actually from the edge of the box. Sort of cut across it and sort of moved away from Leno. He couldn't quite reach. And obviously, Fulham that leaves him 18 from the league. The fast forward in 24 hours, you've got Brighton versus Newcastle. Now, this is a huge game. Um, before the, the Fulham game and the result sort of came in, it's now even bigger because it can alleviate some pressure if someone gets a positive result. And, for Brighton's sake, it finished a positive result for them. They won the game 3-0. Goals from Trossard, Welbeck and Mopé, the, the front three really sort of excelling in this game. And Newcastle were quite toothless, really. Didn't create a lot. Fraser had one chance, which is the post. Um, and they had sort of a couple of other half chances, but nothing sort of worth noting too much. And it's a huge win for Brighton. It puts them, I think, seven points outside the relegation zone, um, which at this stage of the season is quite a big chunk. 
and, and they've also got a fairly decent goal difference. So they're on minus four for someone who's sort of seven, 16th in the league. That's pretty good going. Suggests that they don't get um, battered sort of whenever they do lose. If that makes sense. Uh, moving on to Sunday games, there's two games to talk about. First game was West Ham versus Arsenal. A uh, really, really good game actually. He finished 3-3. Um, there really was a tale of two halves, if I'm totally honest. West Ham absolutely dominated the first half. Went 3-0 up within sort of 33 minutes. Uh, goals from um, Jay Lings. Uh, really, really good strike actually from the edge of the box. Sort of cut across it and sort of moved away from Leno. He couldn't quite reach. He also uh, deserves a bit of credit for the second goal as well. Not only for the assist, but the fast thing in terms of taking a quick free kick. Setting up Bowen and he sort of, well, Leno, Leno should save it in my opinion. Um, and, and probably Leno would agree with that as well. However, obviously, Bert Bowen saw the goal and it put them 2 0 up. And then there's a third goal as well. Antonio's rose like it's absolute salmon, head the ball, it's deflected off Suchek and, and gone into the goal. So, 3 0 up. Arsenal did get a goal back in the first half. It was a Suchek home goal now, so he's scored for both teams um, in the first half. Very fortuitous goal for Arsenal, I would suggest. Um, and then the second half, it was all, all Arsenal and they could have actually gone and won the game. Dawson actually scored an own goal, so West Ham scored two own goals in this game. And incidentally, that's back to back own goals um, for, for Dawson as well, given the fact he scored an own goal against Manchester United the week before. Um, and then Lacazette scored to make it 3 3 after a brilliant cross from Pepe. And I actually think probably was a fair result. Um, Arsenal wrestled the initiative in the second half. Uh, and deserve something out of the game and obviously the first half West Ham were absolutely dominant I think it may be Arsenal will carry a bit of a European hangover from their, from their game on the Thursday night um, and the last game was Aston Villa versus Spurs finished 2 for Spurs still no greenish for Aston Villa um, and still Aston Villa seem to struggle um, we know they struggle when the Greenwich doesn't play such a, a big play for them we don't need to talk about that too much in terms of Spurs interesting uh, lineup. And personnel changes. They actually decided to play two up top with Vinicius coming in with Kane. Um, the Celso started the game as well. Um, Tanganga started, Rodin started. There was a lot of changes for Spurs, and I think that's a reaction from Mourinho in terms of them getting knocked out in the Europa League on, on Thursday night. Uh, it was a positive um, change for them in terms of after when they scored the first goal, so we say. So up until the first goal, <coughs> I think Aston Villa actually okay, dominated possession. Can, controlled the game but never really created a lot not even in half chance really but obviously when Spurs scored that first goal the game changed and it's definitely a lot more of a 50-50 type game so Vinicius scored the first goal after a good play from Kane and Mora and then Kane wins a penalty in the second half and dispatches it because that's what Kane does from the penalty spot so good win for Spurs actually moves them into 6th in the league they're actually only I think it's only 5 points no only 3 points behind Chelsea or 4th in the league and they're only two points behind West Ham, who are fifth in the league, so they're very much in amongst the uh, Champions League positions uh, in terms of sort of um, within reach of it. You've got to bear in mind as well now, Spurs are outside or knocked out of the Europe League, should I say, and Chelsea are still in the Champions League and actually got quite a favourable draw. Um, they've got the sort of um, their eggs in two baskets, if you like, whereas Spurs are sort of they can just go for the league, and obviously they've got one other game in the, in the cup final, and that's just a one off game. so there's no sort of knockout phases in leading up to that final. Um, so yes, I think Spurs are in sort of pole position to, to fight or wrestle that the sort of Champions League position off Chelsea, even though they are two positions behind. And that's not discredit to, to West Ham, I just think Spurs have got more firepower, um, especially if they get Son back and, and Bale continues to sort of play quite well and, and Lucas Moore as well. Other news I want to talk about guys, it was actually really, really big important news for the women's game. So, Sky have announced they have agreed a deal with the FA to be the lead broadcast for the WSL over the next three seasons, so as of the 21-22 season, which is huge news. They've announced there's going to be at least 35 games um, live on Sky, which is massive. Like For me, I've watched the last 18 months, two years, I've started watching the women's game a lot more, and there's a lot of talent in the women's game. I mean, Frank Herb, he's a class player. Uh, Man City have got lots of good players with Greenwood and Halton, Ellen White, etc. United have got some good players, um, and obviously Arsenal, they've got some excellent players as well. And that's not, you know, that's not to say the rest of the league hasn't, but it's, it's really, really improving. And, and if you looked at this year, there's a lot of uh, foreign players that come over to the, the Premier League because they know this is the, the league they all want to play in, um, and it's really become a lot more competitive. 
I think Chelsea signed, um, have made the record signing for, I think, midfielder, I can't remember her name exactly, but it's a record signing for, it's a world record signing for a player in the WSL, I think it was London, like, I don't actually know the figure 100% off the top of my head, but it's like 50,000 or 250,000 or something like that, which doesn't seem a lot compared to the men's game. Um, I think it's 250,000 pounds from Wolfsburg, so it's a record signing, that just goes to show how far the game is behind, um, or the women's game is behind the sort of the English, English game in terms of the men's game, sorry. But uh, no doubt with the Premier League now sort of um, having Sky as a lead broadcaster, it's going to be an influx of, influx of money into the game. And I'm not saying that it's going to be all of a sudden we're going to get millions and millions of pounds spent on individual transfers, I'm not saying that at all, but over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, it's only going to help the game um, grow and sort of um, entice foreign players to come over and play over here. There's a lot of sort of Americans that have come over here, Alex Morgan came over and played, you've got a lot of Australians, Chloe Lagasso came over and played for Bristol, Alana Kennedy, she's also come over from um, Australia to come and play for Spurs as well. So, um, And also you've got some of the Americans, Press and Heath, that come and join United as well. So there's lots of players that are coming from abroad to come and play in the Premier League because this is the league they want to play. That's massive news and congratulations, congratulations, should I say, to Sky and uh, the WSL as well for making that uh, agreement. Right, let's get down to Team of the Year. So, first thing I'm going to say is, formation I've decided on is a 1-4-3-3. reason behind that is a lot of teams sort of traditionally play that sort of front three, if you like, uh, and traditionally sort of play other two sort of holding double pivots and then a, a single turn, or they will play just play three in midfield. Most teams will. I know there's a few that don't, like Burnley don't, for example. Um, and obviously Spurs didn't do yesterday, but generally speaking, they do. That's one reason. Other thing to sort of mention is it is only included. So my thoughts in terms of this um, team of the year is only Premier League based. It's not what they've done in domestic competitions, what they've done in Europe, international level, that kind of thing. Um, however, I might sort of add in a statistic or two just to sort of represents. In the whole season if you like but it's predominantly all to do with the Premier League so what I'll do is I'm just going to run through each position um, give sort of maybe three four five six different names who are sort of worthy of mentioning and then go for a final player so start with the goalkeepers <coughs> um, five goalkeepers for me to sort of mention here Edison yeah, it's obviously been absolutely tremendous hasn't actually had loads to do in terms of shot stopping but what he has done he's done at a good level made it look easy Probably more so, he, he's actually used his, his feet and, and distributed more than he's actually probably had to do with the shot stops. Um, he's actually made 16 clean sheets this season, which is ranked number one in the Premier League. It's the first thing to note. Next goal I'm going to mention is um, Ariola from, from Fulham. Now, they obviously are in the relegation zone. They've signed him from PSG, I believe, or he's on loan from PSG. He's also made nine clean sheets this season. Um, after about half a dozen games in the season, Full of change massively, <clears throat> and since then they really haven't really been smashed by many teams really this season. Since then, really, and only see sort of the odd one or two goals most games. Um, yeah, so they've kept nine clean sheets, which is ranked number six in the Premier League. Uh, Mendy for Chelsea, they've made um, fourteen. Well, he's made fourteen clean sheets this season, which is joint second in the Premier League. Debut season in the Premier League as well, which is also worth noting. Um, and also a change of manager as well so you know that could mean that potentially he isn't in favour of the new manager coming in but obviously he is at the moment which is very, very good um, Nick Pope he's made nine clean sheets this season he is joint sixth along with Ariola as well and uh, Burnley had their troubles at the end of the season when they had no players especially defensive players however Nick Pope was um, a mainstay in that team and that lineup, and he his form never really dipped at all so I think he deserves a worthy mention as well. He's made 102 saves this season, which is ranked fourth in the Premier League. I think one, two, and three are all um, in the relegation zone or in and around the relegation zone with lots of Ramsdale and, that, and them kinds of goalkeepers. And then the last goal I want to mention is Martinez, the Aston Villa goalkeeper. Obviously, he was signed from, from Arsenal, which I can't believe Arsenal have done, but they have done it. Um, they've kept 14 clean sheets, or he's kept it. 14 clean sheets, which is joint second, um, along with Mendy at Chelsea. He's also made 99 saves this season as well, which is joint fifth um, in the Premier League. And on top of that, he, out of the five goalkeepers I've mentioned, he's the only one to make a penalty save as well. So, taking that all into account, 
my goalkeeper for team of the season up to now is I'm going to go with Martinez at Aston Villa. I think he's been been class. Um, I think the penalty save just edges it a little bit more. I know he's had less clean sheets uh, than Edison, um, but he obviously plays for a weaker team as well. And I think he has been class. He's made a lot of saves. Um, he's been the difference between a clean-o and not a clean-o in, in most games um, that sort of Aston Villa have kept clean sheets in. So he deserves um, a spot in my team of the season. Moving on to right-backs. So we're going to talk about right-backs and left-backs and centre-backs because we're not just going to do a, a defender topic. So right-backs, um, for me, there's five again to mention. Um, you've got Reece James at Chelsea. Um, he's got a couple of goals, got one assist, helped with seven clean sheets this season. However, he hasn't played enough, hasn't played uh, regularly enough for me to sort of say he definitely is in my uh, team of the season. Uh, Aston Villa's Matty Cash, I think he deserves a, a definitely a, a deserves a mention. He hasn't scored any goals this season, but he's been involved. Um, he's got two assists and he's had 11 clean sheets as well this season, which obviously plays part with the, the Martinez pick as well. And obviously his debut season in the Premier League, coming from the Championship. Uh, and also, up until a few years ago, he was actually playing as a right winger, so for him to sort of adapt to playing right back um, only for a couple of seasons and obviously at the highest level in the Premier League, he has uh, done very, very well. Um, and obviously that consistency in that Villa defence um, is a bit of a theme as you can as I go through sort of my uh, positions, if you like. One player um, that is actually injured at the moment, I'm going to still incorporate, he's been injured for about a month, so six weeks now, but he has had a terrific sort of three quarters of the season, if you like, um, and that's James Justin of... Um, Leicester City now, he was obviously playing in League One about three years ago. He um, helped get promoted, helped Luton get promoted from the League One to the Championship and then on the back of that help um, got a move to, to Leicester City, which last season he didn't play a huge amount because of the, the form of Chilwell and Pereira. However, obviously injuries at the back end of last season he came in and this season with the departure of Chilwell and Ricardo still not being fully fit, he's been a mainstay, I would be right back or left back, predominantly played right back, second half of the season he played more probably so left back, but I'm as a right back, two goals, two assists and help with nine clean sheets as well, um, however none of those three made the final cut, for me it's between these last two players, moving on to Cancelo then of Manchester City, for me he's been the outstanding right back this season, um, probably he's the outstanding candidate for the position as well, one goal, three assists and 13 clean sheets which is terrific. Um, in terms of Manchester City players, uh, tackles and interceptions combined, he's had 90 this season, which is ranked number one amongst Manchester City players. And then key passes, he's made 34, and dribbles, he's made 36, which is ranked number two of all Manchester City players, which, if you think about it, the players have got the likes of Mahrez, De Bruyne, Gundogan, Foden, all these types of players, and he's ranked number two in those categories, is huge. Um, on top of that, he's also played in that sort of inverted fullback position as well where he goes into midfield and he helps sort of prevent the counter-attack from even starting in some respects uh, which is crucial in the way that Man City play so he's an outstanding candidate for right back and, and this other player for me has been the all those numbers in terms of his goals and assists etc have been huge amounts for me he's been maybe the sign of the season in terms of uh, the fee uh, and also his consistency as well has been tremendous and obviously he's been a mainstay in the West Ham team, that is Souffal. So he has zero goals, four assists and helped with eight clean sheets. Um, like I said before, if Cancelo's form wasn't there, for me, he would be in team of the season. And just because of his consistency, he's one of these players who regularly hits the seven, seven and a half, eight out of ten every week and probably a bit of a manager's dream because you know what you're going to get from him every sort of week. Um, however, taking this into account, Cancelo is my chosen right back. Um, just because of everything he's done at Manchester City this season um, and also he's versatile in terms of he can play in the field and he has played left back as well. So, so far Martinez and Cancelo. Moving on to left backs then. Again there's a few players to sort of, that deserve worthy mentions. You've got Luca Dean at Everton, he deserves a mention. Tierney's been fairly consistent at Arsenal. Herbert has one or two injuries. Robertson had I think during the say the first third of the season for Liverpool he was the one player that stood out that his form didn't really dip compared to everyone else um, this season. Uh, but over, I think the second sort of third of the season, if you like, his form has dipped a bit. Uh, and Matt Target of Aston Villa, he deserves a word mention as well. However, it isn't any of those four. It's been narrowed down to two players, and the two players are Cresswell of, of West Ham United 
and Luke Shaw of Manchester United. So Cresswell has zero goals this season. Now that's quite surprising, normally he chips in with a couple of goals a season. However, there is sort of a quarter of season to go, so he still might do that. He's had 10 assists and 10 clean sheets as well, which is huge, um, especially the assist side of things, that's massive. Um, and then in terms of uh, chances of created, he's had 41 um, in terms of defenders this season, and, and that ranks him in the fourth position as well amongst defenders this season in the Premier League, which is decent for a team that's so called isn't the top six, if you like, or the top four. Um, so yeah, that just goes to show how well West Ham have played this season. And then Luke Shaw, he's had one goal this season. Um, however, he hasn't had as many assists. He's only had five, and he's had with 19 sheets this season as well. However, the tipping point for me, this reason why I'm actually going to go for Luke Shaw over Cresswell is chances created. Luke Shaw, Luke Shaw last season was way, way down in the Premier League. Um, this season, he's ranked number one in the Premier League amongst defenders with 52 which is obviously uh, 11 more than Cresswell so for me that kind of just gives me the edge um, to Luke Shaw uh, and also just an open open play is a little more of a threat in terms of um, with his overlap runs and his over underlap runs a combination play with, with Rashford <coughs> and also with Bruno when he goes on that side or maybe Pogba so for me Luke Shaw gets that position moving on to centre back so now again there's five players to mention I've moved it down to three so the first two are just Whit out of the way. Tyron Mings again, Aston Villa, there's a theme here, he deserves a mention. And I think Wesley Fafana at Leicester City as well, he deserves a mention as well. I think he's, his performances have been very, very consistent. Um, for a young player to come to the Premier League, first season as well, uh, especially when they've had a lot of injuries all across the whole pitch, or especially in the defensive area as well. I think he's stood out and, and done quite well. Um, so yeah, I think he deserves a mention. But I worked it down to three players. Three players are John Stones, Harry Maguire and Diaz. John Stones has scored four goals, hasn't had any assists, helped with 13 clean sheets. Maguire's had two goals, two assists and 12 clean sheets. And Ruben Diaz has had one goal, one assist and 15 clean sheets. So um, each one of them categories, one of them sort of leading in each. So in terms of goals, Stones is leading that with four. In terms of assists, Maguire's winning that with two. Uh, in terms of clean sheets, Diaz has winning that with 15. So, Tough on this one. Diaz, for me, definitely gets in. He's been instrumental um, in terms of the clean sheets at Manchester City, but also his leadership qualities, the stability in the team, um, coming into the team as well, brand new uh, league for him. He's done really, really well. I think he absolutely deserves a spot in the team. And there's a toss-up between Stones and Maguire. Now, for me, I'm going to just give it to John Stones just because when he did enter the team, uh, remember the first sort of, six to ten games he didn't really play too much for Man City and if he did he wasn't playing particularly well um, and then when he did into the team him and Diaz went on a tremendous run of clean sheets and a huge sort of massive run and I think he had like 20 odd games uh, winning streak um, so he was amazing and I think that's the reason why they're going to go and win the league as well so for me Stones, Edges, Maguire only just and then two are my centre and half partnerships so Stones and Diaz are my partnership in terms of centre defence Moving on to centre midfielders, so what I've done here is I've just put in a load of players who I think obviously are worth mentioning and then I'm going to whittle it down to sort of maybe three or four players. So players that are sort of worthy of mentioning are Scott McTominay, done really well for United, being a consistent player. Uh, Tielemans as well at Leicester City, for me he's been their player of the season, um, played loads and loads of games across all competitions this season. Will Prowse, I think he's been really, really good for, for Southampton, he's actually, I think he's a very underrated player in the Premier League. Mason Mount, again, he's a pro manager's dream, just bangs out seven, seven and a half out of ten every week. He can play in multiple positions as well. Um, and Saljek as well at West Ham, obviously he scored nine goals in the Premier League this season. Um, fantastic player from set pieces. Obviously when West Ham get the ball out wide, he rides in the box and it causes problems for the opposition in that respect as well. However, none of them have made the, the cut um, in terms of the sort of central midfielders. I will it down to two players in terms of central midfielders. Um, remember, we're playing three midfielders, so one pivot and then two sort of number eights. So I will it down between Rodri and Declan Rice. Now, Rodri's just been the most simplistic, the most maybe arguably most vital player um, City have had this season in terms of the consistency and just getting on with his job. No one really back in an eyelid. Obviously, he hasn't played every game, but he's played a large chunk of games. Um, also, he adds a bit of aerial presence as well in terms of the set pieces in terms of both boxes as well. Um, so yeah, he's been an ever-present and I think 
the fact that he's almost gone unnoticed is probably a compliment to him because I remember Pep Guardiola saying recently if a holding midfielder is not getting recognised for his quality amongst the press and, and the, the people and amongst the fans etc then that's a little bit of a good thing because actually amongst his players and his teammates and the, and the staff the fact he's not spoken about just know, just goes to show he's just ticking over and doing his job in a really good sort of efficient and productive way however I am going to give it to Declan Rice I think West Ham this season, I don't think he's missed a minute for quite a long time for West Ham in the league, that's including last season as well. He chipped in for one goal and one assist as well, which is nothing to really shout home about. But for me, he's outgrown West Ham already. I think he, if West Ham ended in Champions League, I think he would end up staying. Europa League, there's a 50-50 chance. If they, if they miss out in Europe altogether, I think he almost nailed on he'll leave in the summer. Um, obviously, the pandemic and the financial situation for clubs may also play a part as well. But I just think his consistency, he's got a bit of everything, he can drive in seven midfield. Um, you see in the game yesterday against Arsenal, he had an absolute amazing run where he ran sort of 40, 50 yards with the ball. Um, and actually he's underrated in terms of his distribution on the ball as well. He can receive in the half turn, intercepts a lot, blocks a lot, tackles a lot, decent in the air, very good leadership qualities. Obviously he's a captain at the moment when Noble doesn't play. So yeah, for me, he's in the team. And then this is where it's interesting. So I've got three players to play, three options, if you like, sorry, to play with Declan Rice. Three players I'm going to mention are De Bruyne. De Bruyne has had five goals this season and 11 assists. That's fairly sort of good numbers for, for De Bruyne. Normally he has more assists than goals. Uh, Bruno Fernandes, 16 goals and 12 assists, which is stupid numbers for a midfielder, but it's, you know, he deserves absolute mention in this team. And then Gundogan is, a, is another one to sort of mention as well. He's got 12 goals and 3 assists in the Premier League this season as well. Now for me, Gundogan has an outstanding season this season in terms of goals and assists. He's always been a very consistent player. This season he's played a lot higher. He's played as a false 9 or as a, a number 8 on the left side quite a lot. Um, in, in previous seasons he's played as a single pivot or a double pivot with Rodri or Fernandinho etc. Um, so for me he's in the team. He deserves uh, to be... Along Declan, alongside Declan Rice and then also Bruno Fernandes his numbers are just ridiculous and they're out of this world since he's joined Manchester United this season like I said 16 goals and 12 assists just in the Premier League obviously that's not to mention what he's done in domestic competitions and Champions League Europa League that kind of thing um, so yeah so Bruno Fernandes and Gundogan make the cut they both plays a right side 8 and a left side 8 with Rice playing as a single pivot moving on to the strikers then so there's one outstanding player. Most predictions or people that are going to make these sort of types of predictions, I think, would have this player in the team. But there's three other players that are sort of worth noting and that's worth mentioning as well. And interestingly, they're actually all English. So, in reverse order, I'm going to mention Ollie Watkins, debut season in the Premier League, played in the Championship before that, um, scored 10 goals and 6 assists, and a very good um, Aston Villa team this season. He has regressed a little bit in terms of his output, in terms of numbers, the last sort of half a dozen games or so. Also, that's probably largely down to the lack of availability of Jack Grealish and obviously him being injured. Um, DCL, he scored 16 goals and 6 assists this season as well. Everton are in the league position largely down to him. His goal scoring form at the beginning of the season was outstanding. I think he remember him scored a hat-trick one game. Um, I think it might have been against West Brom in the league. So he deserves, definitely deserves a mention as well. And he has missed a few games as well through injury. <clears throat> Patrick Bamford, again, debut season um, in terms of for Leeds in the Premier League. He has played a few games, uh, I think maybe from Middlesbrough, possibly even Chelsea. He's got 14 goals and got nine assists. That's, again, fantastic numbers. Leeds obviously play a really attractive way, so his numbers are going to be quite high. And then the last player to mention is Harry Kane, who's the outstanding candidate. And Shot Cora, he is my number nine in this team. 17 goals, 13 assists, fantastic numbers. 30 contributions in the Premier League this season. Again, I'm not mentioning internationals. He's obviously got some for England. He's done well for uh, Spurs in the Europa League as well, FA Cup, that kind of thing, uh, League Cup as well. But yeah, he's the outstanding candidate. He goes into the team, no questions asked. Now, for me, the wide forwards is where it gets interesting because I've got quite a lot of players to sort of choose from. So what I've done is I've got three players that play on the right and four players that play on the left, and that's how I went it down. So. It's not necessarily, um, I'm, I'm, pick, I'm picking a player that plays predominantly on the right-hand side to play on the right and a player that plays on the left to play on the left. I'm not 
thinking right there's three outstanding left wingers I'm going to chuck one of them on the right and just to get the team know I'm going to have a player that plays predominantly on the right side so for me the left the left we'll go for the left wing to start with there's there's sort of four players to mention here you've got Ashley, Ashley Barnes Harvey Barnes should I say of Leicester City nine goals five assists he's been a crucial player for them this season again in Europe he's done really well and across the cup competitions as well <clears throat> Marcus Rashford, nine goals, nine assists. Brilliant again this season. Good numbers. That's the sort of numbers he needs to be hitting regularly, um, season in, season out. Jack Grealish, he's regressed a little bit. Obviously, he's missed the last sort of month or so in terms of injury. So he's got six goals, got twelve assists. So he's more of a assist maker, if you like. And the last player is Son. He's got thirteen goals and got nine assists. Now I'm going to give it to Son just because of the partnership he has with Harry Kane as well, and that's obviously going to suit this team if you like in some respects um, but obviously he has got the most goals and he has um, got the joint second most assists as well um, can play in a couple of different positions as well and plays a number nine and can play on the right like a lot of the other wingers can as well to be fair but um, I think his his form for large parts of the season has been fairly consistent he's always been a threat um, so he makes the team he's going to play on the left hand side and then the right side I think you guys this is where I think this might cause the most controversy uh, amongst you guys that are watching um, this episode. So I've got three players. I've got Salah, who has got 17 goals, four assists. But for me, his form has been up and down this season. And he doesn't make um, the final cut. So I've it down to two players. The two players for me are Rafinha at Leeds. He's got six goals, seven assists. So it's a lot less than what Salah has. Um, and then the other player is Pedro Neto. Five goals and seven assists. So he... In terms of key contributions, goals and assists, he's got the least out of the three players. Um, but for me, he, I'm choosing Pedro Neto. I think he showed the most um, consistency this season. He's been, Wolves is probably most threat, most games I'll say this season, even when Pedenta's been playing, Traore, Jimenez, all these types of players. So for me, he actually gets in ahead of Rafinha. No, not to say Rafinha's had a bad season at all, because he's had a terrific season. He's done tremendously well for Leeds this season. Again, debut season in the Premier League, brilliant. Um, and then, to be honest with you, it was a bit of a toss of a coin between those two players, but I'm just giving it to Neto. I just feel like he's had more of a consistent season. He's a younger player as well. It's always harder for a younger player to adapt to the Premier League, but for me, he's going to win Wolves' players of the season. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if both of these two players left their respective clubs, if not this summer, definitely the following summer, because for me, they're the outstanding players at those clubs. Um, Again, the pandemic and the financial situation might play um, a part in terms of other clubs coming in and being able to afford these types of players. But for me, Pedro Neto deserves uh, a mention, um, more than a mention, he's actually made the cut. So for me, he's going to be on my right side, son on the left, and then Harry Kane up top. Guys, that is my team of the season for the 2021 season. Honestly, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this one because it's going to cause some debates amongst you guys. If you've got a, a different player you'd like to mention that should be in the team, it's team of the year, should I say, for this season, please mention it. I would actually really like to hear everyone's team of the season. So in the comments below, leave your team of the season. Do you agree with this one completely? I'm sure, I don't think anyone will agree with it 100%. They might agree with seven, eight players, whatever. But leave your whole 11. I'm really, really intrigued to see what everyone's thoughts are in terms of team of the season, um, or my team of the season, and how you think... Um, my formation and all that kind of thing sort of plays hand in hand and, and partnerships that kind of thing that concludes another episode guys of the Premier League Appetizer Show if you haven't subscribed to the channel already please do so honestly it does help the channel grow a little bit further and also one other thing to sort of mention as well if you haven't clicked that notification bell do it right now because you're obviously going to get notified whenever there's a video uploaded from our channel but also our football content is going to be uploaded onto YouTube in the next week or so so you do not want to miss that there's our first video going live the next week or so and then there's going to be a bunch more sort of coming out on the weeks on the back of that so yeah click that uh, notification bell once you guys it really will help the channel a little bit further and we'll see you on next week